can't thank you enough for joining us. And uh, I think you're in for a treat. We have uh, three wonderful experts here to talk to us, not only about streetcars, but also about inner city high speed transportation and economic development. So there's a lot here to cover and I think you'll find it very informative. Uh, before we get to the speakers, there are some people I want to recognize and some people to thank. First of all, the Erie County Library and the staff and their technical staff for uh, making this wonderful venue available to us. Also want to thank, of course, uh, our staff from uh, All Aboard Erie who helped put this on. Um, we have the assistance today of Joel Natale from radio station WCTL. Joel, down here in the corner, is going to be assisting us with our question and answer uh, session. We also want to thank CATV uh, Cable TV here in the city of Erie for taping this, so it will be available uh, later. And we want to thank all of our elected and public officials here today uh, from City Council, County Council, uh, Erie Downtown Development Corporation. Uh, they're all represented here today, so thank you very much. And of course, uh, last but not least, uh, I want to mention someone who is in the audience. I want to recognize Erie's hometown streetcar expert and author, Ken Springer. Ken is down here in the, in the front row. You get all the applause, Ken. I don't understand that. Uh, but we want to thank him for all his help and his book, which was invaluable to us in preparing this event. This is um, Greater Erie Trolleys, and the history in here is quite amazing. Uh, and then I want to introduce our sponsor. Uh, this event is sponsored by Brookville Equipment Corporation, which you may not have heard uh, much about, but they are the, the leading supplier of streetcars in the United States, and right here in Brookville, Pennsylvania. So I want to welcome Adam Mone. Adam, if you want to come up and just say a few words, so let's have a round of applause for Adam. Good afternoon, folks, and we want to thank uh, All Aboard Erie and uh, Brian for hosting us here today and allowing us to uh, sponsor this program. Uh, it's very exciting for us as a, as a local manufacturer to see a local community like Erie uh, become excited about streetcars and opportunities uh, to hopefully uh, have a streetcar system in the future. Uh, a little bit about our organization. Uh, we've been around for 100 years. Uh, we were founded in 1918, so we're celebrating our 100th anniversary this year. We've been a rail equipment manufacturer for the duration of that time period, getting our start in small switching. Uh, and in, industrial locomotives uh, along the railroads in the region. Eventually became a global manufacturer uh, throughout the early part of the 20th century uh, before migrating into mining equipment. And that's where we got our experience with trolley technology in the 1980s and 90s. Uh, so then we kind of transitioned into the streetcar market. Uh, if you're curious as to where our streetcars are operating, uh, if you're familiar with some of the systems in the United States, uh, we've provided uh, propulsion and, and truck systems for the red cars in New Orleans. Uh, we provided restoration and moder modernizations for the PCC streetcars in Philadelphia, uh, as well as restorations for the PCC fleet in San Francisco. And most recently, uh, we've restored and modernized six PCC streetcars uh, for the city of El Paso, uh, as they reintroduced their line for the first time since the 1970s. And we also have a modern streetcar platform, uh, dubbed the Liberty Platform, which is an articulated low floor platform that also has off-wire capabilities. Uh, those streetcars are currently running in Detroit and Dallas, Texas. And uh, in the next two months, we'll have two more systems open. That's Oklahoma City uh, and Milwaukee, the city of Milwaukee. Uh, we also have future orders uh, for, for uh, streetcars that will operate in the cities of Tempe, Arizona, Tacoma, Washington, and Portland, Oregon. So, uh, with no further ado, I'll turn it over to the panel, and if you have any questions, I'll be available during the Q&A session, uh, as well as uh, you can, you know, I'll be around. So, uh, again, thanks for coming today, and uh, we're excited at the opportunity to sponsor. Thank you. Thank you very much, Adam. Um, I thought before we introduce our speakers, I'd give just a quick background of how we got where we are uh, to this uh, position. Uh, once upon a time, Erie had a vibrant streetcar system, not just a single line running up and down State Street, but a robust system serving riders citywide from Waldemere Park on the west side to Iroquois Avenue on the east side and beyond. At its peak, it had more than 100 trolleys and 65 miles of track with a ridership of 14 million passengers a year. And this not, that's an amazing figure for, for a town in the 1920s that didn't even have 100,000 people. 
But Erie Railways, Erie Street Railways, as it was known, was a private company and was not able to survive both the Depression and the coming of the automobile. When its last run was made on May 12, 1935, there was no public entity to step up and take the controls, and thus it disappeared into history. So why are we talking about a streetcar in Erie more than 80 years later? Thanks to the comprehensive and compelling study known as Erie Refocused, the Erie community has been challenged to create an iconic connection between the downtown and the Bayfront. And then, just a few months ago, the Urban Land Institute called for a tram to traverse State Street from Dobbins Landing to Union Station on 14th Street. Could the lowly streetcar be the means by which the Erie community addresses both these challenges? All aboard Erie thinks the answer might be yes. To that end, two years ago, we invited Peter Voorhees from the Cleveland office of AECOM to visit Erie to see the lay of the land and, oh, by the way, come up with an outline of a plan for a streetcar in downtown Erie, one that just might be the iconic connection. And Peter did just that. And he did it without cha charging all aboard Erie or anyone else a single penny. Imagine that. And so when the Urban Land Institute's recommendation was announced, we invited Peter to return to Erie again to present his plan to the public, which we're going to see today, knowing that the gravitas of the ULI was pushing the streetcar idea forward. And so Peter is back in Erie for a third time. And this time he has reinforcements, and they too have concepts and experience to share with us. And once again, every one of our speakers today is here so doing um, at, on their own time, at their own expense, and at no charge to the people of Erie. I think that's quite remarkable. Would you give our speakers a hand? <clears throat> so let me introduce our speakers. Please welcome Peter Voorhees, transportation planner extraordinaire with AECOM, the world's largest infrastructure firm. Dina Lopez from the Mid-Ohio Regional Planning Commission in Columbus, where she serves as project manager for the Rapid Speed Transportation Initiative. And last but not least, Mark Dorn, AECOM Vice President and Transportation Design Engineer of Rail Transit Projects. Mark has managed many of the largest such projects in cities across the U.S. state, across the U.S. So please, let's have a warm welcome for our speakers. Well, thank you, Brian. Thank you, all aboard Erie. Thank you, Brookville, for sponsoring. And thank you all for being here. Um, again, my name is Peter Voorhees. I'm a transportation planner. And we've talked a bit about streetcar here. Uh, and yes, we will be talking more about streetcar. But in our presentation, we're covering more than that. Um, we thought it would be helpful to think not just about the needs for moving around downtown Erie, central Erie, but also what, what are some of the benefits of thinking about connecting some of the larger cities in this western Pennsylvania, northern, you know, northeast Ohio region to Erie. And, uh, you know, when people get here, how are they going to get around? So, We'll get into this. Um, we're going to move pretty quickly through the, the presentation stuff here. Uh, I'll talk about some of these connections between cities. I'll hand it over to Dina to talk about her study, um, which is a multi-state study connecting Chicago and uh, Columbus and Pittsburgh. And uh, <laughs> when you're ready, I'll well, okay, that's that's fine. I'll, I'll start out with with a few slides, and I'll I'll hand it over, um, and then we're going to hand it over to Mark Dorn, who is you know one of the leading experts in the country on developing streetcar projects, and so we can focus in on the needs in Central Erie. But let's just move forward. So I, I I'm asking the question here, you know, why is Erie important to some of our neighboring bigger cities, Pittsburgh and and Cleveland? Uh, we know about Pittsburgh. We've all been to Pittsburgh, right? We know how it's a, a thriving metropolis. And it, it's been wonderful to see the transition, you know, since the 1970s into a new kind of city. 
It's just a, a great place to be, great place to get out and walk around and see the neighborhoods. Uh, it's a fun place to experience without a car. Um, so on, on my trip here, um, my plans were to be in Pittsburgh and Erie and Columbus before getting back home to Cleveland. And I attempted to do the whole thing without a car. And I just couldn't quite do it. The, the Greyhound schedule didn't quite work for me. So I did have to rent a car. But I, I love to get into a city without a car and just experience it on foot and on the public transit system. Um, and I love this picture of Mr. Rogers here, by the way, in Pittsburgh. Part of it, it, Mr. Rogers was, was my probably original inspiration to get into transportation planning. So what doesn't Pittsburgh have? It doesn't have Presque Isle. It doesn't have a spectacular Great Lake. It doesn't have those sandy beaches. And it doesn't have mighty fine donuts. <laughs> so let's talk about Cleveland for a moment. Um, Cleveland is really making its comeback. Has anybody been to Playhouse Square in Cleveland? Big theater district. We've heard it's maybe the second largest concentration of live theater in the United States outside Manhattan world-class symphony orchestra, the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, of course, a wonderful Tower City and a, and a comeback downtown. Another good multimodal city, a great place to experience without a car. What doesn't Cleveland have? Well, a couple things I'll toss in here. Uh, the Ravine Flyer 2, I will put up against any roller coaster in Ohio. Anyone, including anything at Cedar Point. Um, and I keep hearing from people in, in Cleveland who, in the summertime, head for Chautauqua. And when they do it, they have to come through Erie. And we want people to come into Erie, spend their time in Erie, and then they can get on a bus and go over to Chautauqua or whatever. We don't want them just on the highway going straight out there. Um, you know, and it's, it's in your neighborhood. I, I think of it as Greater Erie. I don't know if you think of it that way, but I do. <clears throat> so. Just thinking about connecting these regions, you know, we can draw some lines on the map and, and, you know, we can come back and revisit some of this stuff in discussion if you would like to or offline, I can give you my card, whatever, I'd love to continue conversations. But there are lots of great old legacy downtowns that are ready to be linked um, with passenger transportation so people can experience these cities. And there are lots of ways to connect cities. Um, buses, you know, some of us have been on Greyhound recently. Greyhound isn't the only, you know, bus option. Um, when I'm traveling down to Columbus or, or whatever to get work done, I'm always looking for a way to do it without a car because, hey, you know, six hours out of my work day just driving isn't going to cut it. I need to be getting work done. I would love to have, you know, a nice, cozy seat to sit in and recline and open my computer and get to work. Um, it, you know, lots of different train technologies to connect and some developing technologies. Dina will talk about one of those. I'm working with Dina on a, a study to connect uh, Chicago, Columbus, and Pittsburgh with an emerging, you know, Hyperloop technology. The goal here is to travel close to 700 miles per hour with surface transportation. So, you know, I'll ask the question, what about highways? Are highways enough? We've got lots of them. And since World War II, that's what we've invested in. But is, are we looking for more? Are we looking for other options? A lot of people are. You know, here's somebody working on the train. That's what I want to be doing. A lot of people just uh, electing for whatever reason to, to ride the bus between cities. Um, there are people who, who can't drive for a variety of reasons. We want to accommodate them and, and not have that be a sort of second class experience, right? And, and it's just fun as you're traveling to get some rest or socialize with friends, have a good time. And then there are the land use implications. Uh, above, we've got in you know, Florida or one of our sunny states, uh, a nice Walmart parking lot. And below is uh, downtown San Diego. We've got the uh, Santa Fe train station sort of in the background there. Um, uh, rapid bus improvement, you know, the light rail system that's been going since the 1980s. 
and look at how the downtown has responded to this kind of transportation investment. It's just a wonderful place to be. <coughs> Excuse me. But there are cha challenges paying for this stuff, right? And, and you read the papers and, and you see around the country where there are projects or proposed projects. There are always challenges coming to an agreement and how to pay. Well, one thing I'll just cover very briefly here is there are some new models emerging. Um, if anybody gets down to Florida, take the time to ride a system that's known as the Bright Line. This is a privately funded, privately financed uh, inner city transportation project. It's short now, it's, I don't know, 50 plus miles right now, but, and it's brand new, but the goal is to extend this between Miami and Orlando. And they went from having no service in the corridor to almost overnight running 14 round trips in the corridor. And here's how they do it. Um, so there's, there's the corridor and, and they're under construction to get to Orlando. So how do they do this with private money? Well, they get bonds for the construction and what are those bonds backed by? land development to a great extent. Um, unlike a public entity, they're able to buy land and redevelop around a station. And they're doing it in a fairly intense way. I mean, up to, you know, 70 stories or so. And they have these spectacular, wonderful stations that have good retail options and they're connected in with office complexes. So land and rent, that's how they're backing the bonds. Well, here in Erie, we've got a wonderful old station, right? Um, and there's a lot of land around it that would be nice to develop. So maybe we've got an opportunity for something like a privately led, you know, inner city opportunity here. Now, I'm gonna turn this over to Dina. So Dina, I'll pull up your presentation. And take it away, Dina Lopez. I'm a little shorter than Peter. <laughs> Thank you, everyone, uh, for uh, inviting uh, me and others to be here today to speak to you about uh, choices in transportation. Because ultimately, that's what it comes down to, is how do we provide choices to our communities so that they don't have to necessarily drive everywhere. There's some people that might not be able to drive for d different reasons, as Peter mentioned earlier. So uh, that is something that the Mid-Ohio Regional Planning Commission, the agency that I work for, uh, has really uh, been working very hard um, for many decades now, but it's kind of had a revival in the, with new leadership and new staff coming along uh, that we are really focusing on what can we do to bring more uh, multimodal transportation for passengers uh, and for people uh, to central Ohio. So I'm a bit of a storyteller. So usually the way that I speak is that I like to kind of lay it out so you kind of know the background and I can kind of almost feel like you were there. Uh, I came to the Mid-Ohio Regional Planning Commission in 2013. And since then, uh, my specialty is freight. And as you know, freight is the mass movement of people and goods. Sometimes they forget the people part, but transit, high-speed rail, all those things are forms of freight, really, except that the goods are us, our people. So uh, back in 2013, MORPC, uh, before I go into that, I'm just gonna give you a little bit of an overview of our agency and what we do. Uh, we are a metropolitan planning organization, and we are uh, uh, led by a board of members that are all the municipalities and uh, elected officials of Central Ohio. Uh, the, the, the green area that you see here is what we distribute certain infrastructure funds for, and the blue is just the, our planning area and our collaboration across central Ohio. Our areas uh, include transportation and funding, which is the group I work under, sustainability, um, data and mapping. We have uh, the most robust uh, data and mapping uh, collection and information of the region. Uh, we have state officials that come, or state en entities that come to us for refined data uh, on central Ohio. So 
so we take a lot of pride in the data and mapping uh, that we have in our agency. Uh, we also have a public policy arm, and this is where we advocate for uh, transportation uh, infrastructure funding and policy that will facilitate uh, you know, the uh, execution or construction of more infrastructure in our region. Last but not least, uh, the Mid-Ohio Regional Planning Commission is the first uh, metropolitan planning organization in the country that has uh, created a brand new, like its own little section of energy. Uh, air quality tends to be clumped in with transportation, but uh, you know, the Mid-Ohio Regional Planning Commission actually looks at how can we diversify our energy sources. We've done an energy baseline study for our county, and we're trying to kind of carve a new path in energy planning so that we can get our community thinking of how we can become more sustainable, like realistically sustainable over time. So, one of the things that, you know, we, uh, you know, we, we have uh, always been involved in is passenger rail. Uh, back in 2013, when I returned to Ohio and was working with the, with MORPSI, that's our acronym is MORPSI, uh, we, uh, they, one of the projects that was given to me was an effort to uh, establish a passenger rail line between Chicago and Columbus. At the time, I don't know how much of you guys follow uh, Ohio politics, state politics, but our uh, state DOT uh, was not, under the current administration, is not very supportive of passenger rail uh, and passenger rail funding. So uh, we knew that our task in the next eight years uh, would be to basically bring these projects as far along as we could within what are the resources we had. Basically get as much of the planning and other studies done so that when the right political window and opportunity came about, we actually had something to advance rather than go back to studying it from, from, from you know, uh, now that we have funding type of um, situation. So uh, the other thing too, is we started seeing a lot of trends. As you know, millennials uh, prefer, have a, a, a established preference for other modes of transportation that is not single occupancy vehicles. Uh, so Morpsey started looking at, uh, you know, in investing a lot more time in, in, in advancing passenger rail and we created partnerships from Columbus all the way to Chicago through a memorandum of understanding. We had counties, municipalities, and other metropolitan planning organizations actually come on board to work with us on this. So we took it from a grassroots up, from local up. And in doing that, uh, we uh, were able to start very piecemeal collecting information and data for the type of environmental studies that we, need to, we would need to do in order to approve a passenger rail line. As all of that was unfolding, um, we started, you know, we knew that there was a new technology out there called Hyperloop. Uh, and uh, we, uh, you know, we decided with all the hype around transit and transit-oriented communities and us trying to attract uh, not just attention from other government entities to advance these projects, also from the local business community and from the local like, like voters, because ultimately infrastructure is a voting item uh, that, that, that we wanted to kind of make people more aware that when you vote, there's all these different things that, that have to do with your transportation as well. So we uh, wanted to uh, make sure that we were connecting all these different regions and all these different areas across the state um, and observing and basically taking advantage of the momentum that was happening with, this, with the conversations in our, in our region. Um, at the time, Hyperloop, this map here is of uh, the emerging mega regions across the US. Uh, this type of technology, Hyperloop, it's incredibly fast speed, it's 700 miles an hour uh, is the maximum that it can achieve. So really the way that, 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 that experts are approaching it are more from a, a mega region um, transportation network. So you know, if you're, if you're flying across the country, you wouldn't be taking a Hyperloop, you would be flying uh, if you're traveling across to the West Coast. But if you're going say from Columbus to Erie, you know, we ideally would have either a passenger rail or a Hyperloop uh, service that we could do. So uh, when we prepared um, a, a proposal back in 2016, uh, we based it on that very initial, um, you know, project of the passenger rail. We tapped into all the partners. It took us two years to create those partnerships and those relationships with all those communities you see along this map. And so when we had this opportunity to put in a proposal for Hyperloop technology with a technologist company called Virgin Hyperloop One, we approached all these guys and said, hey, Morpsey's, we'll do it on our dime. 
We will write it, we will submit it. All we need to know is, are you willing to go down this path with us? Are you willing to look at this as we look at passenger rail as well, so that we're looking at existing technology, existing passenger rail, and we're also keeping an eye on the future to try and prepare for, future, for the future of transportation. So as we started putting together a proposal for this Virgin Hyperloop one, a lot of the information that we had gathered or, or, or um, um, you know, we, all the information that we had already gathered and analyses that we had already done for passenger rail uh, was very applicable to this technology as well. Uh, we also decided at that point that if we're, we're, we're gonna do Hyperloop, we might as well extend it all the way to Pittsburgh and also include the passenger rail all the way to Pittsburgh. So in a way, it was almost like a vehicle, like it garnered a lot of a, a attention and support from our local governments. And so we kind of married these two projects uh, under the premise of the Rapid Speed Transportation Initiative, which focuses on better, faster connections across these three cities rather than by mode. Uh, this is a, a, here, we, you know, one of the things that we wanted to understand too was the businesses along the corridor. Like what, what, what kind of business activity uh, do we have that could reinforce the argument that this technology is you know, worthy of our corridor. And one of the things we found is that, as you can see, the yellow dots represent Fortune 500 companies along the corridor. So we had, you know, a, a significant amount of them. Uh, we also uh, looked at the travel time by different modes. Like, currently, we don't have any direct highway connection between Columbus and Chicago. It's all through county roads, and it's a little bit of a, you know, uh, convoluted way to get to, to Chicago. So uh, this here, this graphic here shows you the difference between flying by air, which is usually, you know, about an hour and five if you get, if you're lucky enough to get a direct flight, uh, about five and a half hours by car. Uh, and according to the, to the technology um, information that we have at this point, it would be about 24 minutes uh, to Chicago. Now that is if we were able to achieve maximum speeds for that, but the reality is, is that there's a lot of different turning angles and different things. So maybe it would take us an hour and a half, but still, it's, it, it, it shortens up these travel times for us. It's disruptive, and it's completely, uh, it's disrupted the way that the automobile was disruptive to our everyday lives. So uh, we, uh, we put all of this together, submitted this application to Virgin Hyperloop One, and we were selected as one of 10 global winners. They had 2,400 applications from across the world, and uh, the Mid-Ohio Regional Planning Commission was one of the last 10 uh, that were selected. And what that really meant was that the technologists would work with us, would partner with us in figuring out how do we get it built. Uh, they're working on the technology. They've cleared milestones that they've, that, that they've, that, that they've set in order to um, you know, of, in order to determine if the, if the um, technology is viable. So they've continued to meet those milestones and it, they continue to work with Washington to figure out how it would be regulated, how it would be implemented. And in the meantime, us, as their partner, we're trying to figure out, we're helping them in that effort and also applying it to an actual corridor. Uh, as part of that, when we went to, uh, we went, out to LA to their head offices and also to their test track. They are the only technology firm in Hyperloop uh, technology that have an actual test track out in the Nevada desert. I welcome you to look it up online. They have some videos there showing you the different tests that they're doing with the technology. This is a team of us that were out there uh, uh, last year for the first visit. Uh, and uh, it, you know, it was, it, it was, it, once you're there and you see it, you're like, oh, this is, okay, this is actually happening. And the other very interesting thing was is that as we were going through these discussions and this challenge and this competition, uh, Virgin Mobile partnered with them and thus, be, thus it became Virgin Hyperloop One. And Richard Branson is the new CEO of this company. And for those of you who follow Mr. Branson, he's not somebody who throws his, 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 his brand or uh, his, his company uh, on just about anything. So that for us was yet another flag or encouragement that we were going down in the right direction. 
this is a rendering. At this time, we made it, you know, we made, we, we won this thing and we wanted to really get a sense, get the public excited. Uh, we approached the uh, Columbus Partnership, which is a, an organization of all the top CEOs of Columbus, Ohio. That includes representatives from Nationwide, American Electric Power, all, you know, every, every big name you can think of in Columbus has a, has a, a presence uh, in, this, in this partnership. And they actually uh, endorsed this. They, they have fallen really, you know, uh, they, they've been fantastic in their support of it. Uh, they allowed us or, or, or provided pro bono, and this is a rendering of what a potential Hyperloop look, uh, line would look like. As you can see, there's a rail line there. That's a freight rail line that goes along it, and uh, then you have the Hyperloop uh, on top. So about the Rapid Speed Transportation Initiative. So as we were developing all of this, all of these different projects, you know, we knew that in order for us to advance the passenger rail under the existing environment, political environment, uh, with our state DOT, that we would need to be creative. And so in, 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 in pulling in the Hyperloop uh, project, it allowed us to get more funding for the passenger rail efforts as well. So some may call it shady, others may call it creative. I leave that up to you. Uh, we've been very transparent, you know, that, this, that we're pursuing both modes. Uh, we have people that, you know, we get it from both ends. Passenger rail enthusiasts are not crazy about Hyperloop. Hyperloop people are not crazy about passenger rail. So it's been fun <laughs> on, the, on the ground in terms of, uh, you know, wanting to advance these two projects. And, you know, a lot of people ask the question, why are you going for both modes? And our response to that is to be globally competitive the way that our region wants to be. You know, we need to have more choices for people. They should have that choice of whether they want to take a plane or a Hyperloop or a train. And it also just incentivizes economic development, you know, around stations for both of these technologies. So our uh, current rapid speed transportation initiative uh, has about $2.5 million worth of uh, studies that we're doing at this time. Uh, there's two studies underway. There's a Hyperloop feasibility study, which Peter Voorhees is leading. And then we also have a tier one EIS component study for passenger rail as well as Hyperloop. So we're the first in the nation to actually be out there and try to uh, figure out how an environmental or NEPA approval process, which is a, a requirement in any surface transportation project, like how, what would that look like for a brand new technology? So, you know, we're doing this at the same time. You know, it's, 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 there's no set roadmap, no pun intended, <laughs> uh, on this right now. So it's been you, it, it just unmentionably amazing how good it has been to partner with people like Ecom and WSP on these two studies because we're basically just like figuring it out as we go. Uh, the future phases is to complete that EIS or to complete the, because right now we only have, we've only been able to do partial funding of that. Uh, we're working on that next injection of funds to finish up the environmental. Uh, but the, the great news is, is that we will have that passenger rail stuff is gonna get done as part of this and we will advance the conversation on a regu regulatory framework for a brand new technology uh, and with Hyperloop. So, um, one of the things that we did as part of our proposal was to really understand uh, what, would, what would a Hyperloop system look like. Uh, we have a, a transportation modeler in, our, in, in the house <laughs> at Morpsey, and uh, he did a great job of basically uh, simulating for the year 2040 what a, a mode split would look like. Right now, the, 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 the figure you see on the left here is basically what it would look like without a Hyperloop. And then the one on the right is what it would look like, uh, you know, with a Hyperloop. So we did find as part of that analysis, you know, uh, making some assumptions uh, that there would be approximately 1.9 million Hyperloop passengers per year, uh, you know, by 2040, should there be an actual system in place. Uh, then we also looked at cargo, which is really our focus on this study, is we're focusing on cargo because uh, the Ohio Department of Transportation actually decided to fund this study for us. Uh, and so they, are, but they're, of course, as, you, as I mentioned earlier, uh, our DOT is not very um, embracive of uh, passenger rail. So they were very specific that, that this was for freight. Like, what would it mean to freight? And, you know, 
from my freight goods hat perspective, I'm extremely excited in figuring out how, what this would mean. Imagine what being able to move goods within an hour, what, when it normally would take you six. Imagine what it would mean, what it would mean for fresh foods and produce and food deserts that may be happening along, along the corridor. So we looked at um, the manufacturing of goods in Pennsylvania and in Indiana and Ohio and reimagined what that would look like, how that could be incentivized. And we also linked it to a cargo airport that we have uh, that is, air, like it's a commercial airport, sorry, an air cargo only airport at Rickenbacker Airport. And basically having it, this be part of an of a, of a integrated multimodal freight system. So that's been a, a lot of fun and you know on some nights it makes you lose sleep a little bit as you're trying to figure it out but uh, it, overall it's it's exciting to be um, at the cutting edge of those types of discussions uh, so the funding because it all comes down to funding how the heck are we paying for this uh, like I mentioned back in 2013 2014 working on the passenger rail we were starting to lose our you know, like people were starting to get discouraged by the current state of, you know, the, the current environment towards passenger rail. We were starting to see our biggest members that were supporting it starting to wane off, you know, realizing this is like, this is gonna be harder than we thought. So with the Hyperloop um, project, it, it just injected a whole bunch of, of interest. So now we have partners that include the state DOT the City of Columbus, which has funded uh, $250,000 for the Tier 1 EIS studies. The City of Lima, who has been an active, uh, amazing partner in this. Mayor Berger out of Lima uh, raised 70000 in Lima for this and, and, and threw it into these studies. Uh, the City of Marysville has also contributed funds. Union County, Morpsey has some of its funds as well in there. And we are now working on a private sector uh, funding strategy to kind of continue these projects uh, forward. So that is kind of my story for you today is like, I guess the biggest message to take away from it is at a local level or a regional entity, we have to get creative in an era or in, a, in an environment where the road and the highway seems to be the, the default and the, and, and the, and the priority uh, for most of our DOTs and some of our members. Uh, so, you know, uh, that's, um, to us, that's been um, the biggest takeaway in all of this is that if you are bold, you have to be bold, you have to be ready uh, to stumble and perhaps, you know, um, get into heated arguments about certain things. But the way that we see it is, this is kind of our time to uh, pave the way for a new technology. We're due. As human beings, we don't, we've never stood static in the way that we move ourselves and our stuff. Every, so, every 100 or so years, 150 years, we develop a new, brand new mode. We saw it with the railroad. We saw it with the automobile. We saw it with the airplane. So it's a matter of time before something else comes along. If, we con if we're continuing uh, you know, to, to, to progress in the right direction, uh, we need to be looking at technologies like this. And sometimes it takes a, a, a handful of brave local communities to come together and say, let's just see what happens. And I'm very, very fortunate to be part of this amazing adventure. So thank you so much, and I look forward to your questions. Wonderful. Thank you, Dina. Well, we've talked about connecting cities, right? But a lot of you came to talk about how to connect things right here in Central Erie, right? And we've heard interest uh, from all aboard Erie and, and more recently from uh, Urban Land Institute in specifically the idea of streetcar. So why don't we have a look at that? And so with that, I would like to introduce Mark Dorn and you will find no one else in the United States with more expertise with streetcar technology than Mark Dorn. So, Mark. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you for coming out. I really appreciate the opportunity. Uh, as you know, Dina's presentation was very exciting. It, it's um, it's really uh, exciting to look into the future and and what the next technology uh, could be or should be. Uh, in the the story of the modern streetcar, the the revival of the modern streetcar services, 
over the last uh, 12 to 15 years is kind of a, a back to the future uh, story. Uh, I was fortunate enough to be involved in probably a dozen uh, projects uh, involving modern uh, streetcar technology over the last uh, 15 years. And uh, in 2010, I was part of a study by, um, sponsored by the city of Portland doing a master plan. And one document we created uh, was called Why Streetcars. And, and really, uh, and you can find this online with the City of Portland uh, Planning Department. It may also be on the Portland Streetcar website as well. But uh, some of the objectives uh, for modern streetcar systems are very similar to how they began at the beginning of the, the turn of last century, and, and that they're very development uh, driven. Uh, you know, the, the streetcars back then were, were put into place by the, the developers trying to broaden the the housing and, and economic um, uh, centers in, in the cities down in downtowns. Um, but there's uh, more to it than that right now as, as the suburban sprawls have, have occurred in, in many of our metro regions, there's an intense effort to now absorb uh, uh, population growth and have more sustainable uh, objectives and creating more walkable communities and, and being less reliant on on uh, the automobile. Um, so, you know, there's a, there's a bit of a knock on streetcar services uh, in, in some of the systems and that they're very slow, but really there's different services that can be provided by a modern streetcar and, and it really is how you want to design it or, you know, what is, in, in planning speak, what is the purpose and need of a streetcar investment? It can behave much like a regional light rail system. It depends on how you design it and if, and if you uh, create the, the dedicated right of way to increase the speeds. Or it can be that downtown, you know, local neighborhood connector, uh, as some have dubbed it, you know, a walk extender. So, uh, so I'm just going to step through some of the different services and cite a couple examples of, of how we've implemented uh, such, such services across the country. Um, you know, streetcars can be a, a, a good tourist attraction. You know, it's a linkage to the old heritage of, a, of the last century, and, and um, we were involved in the El Paso project. You know, that project, uh, which Adam mentioned, uh, began because the city councilor saw the old PCC cars sitting by the runway in the airport, and she wanted to bring those back into activation, and so now they're about to open their their downtown circulator system using the old vehicles. In, in Tampa, these are replica trolleys made by Gameco, uh, and this service connects the ferry terminals to the entertainment district in, in Ybor City. Um, it can also be a very important uh, you know, uh, first and last mile service for a regional connection, much like uh, Peter is describing with, with Erie Union Station and you know, getting people to and, and from a, a regional service. You know, Charlotte has a, a grand vision of a 10-mile uh, streetcar system that feeds into their downtown and connects to their commuter rail and light rail systems. Uh, Tacoma, um, when they opened their commuter rail system and they then supplemented that with a modern streetcar service, the ridership on that circulator service, which was a bus before, jumped five, uh, five-fold. And in, it also helped increase the, the commuter rail ridership. But I think one of the better stories is in Seattle with the, their regional light rail system opened in uh, 2010, I believe, and came into the downtown. This is um, essentially a graphic of the transit tunnel ending in Westlake, which is on the, on the left. Um, and so the plan was to extend the light rail system th into the first hill and the suite, you see the Swedish campus there, there's uh, three hospitals uh, and it would be an, un it's up on the hill and this station would have been 400 feet underground and there was very difficult geological challenges that made this, in, along with the, the long tunnel alignment, uh, essentially a $400 million station. Uh, so very expensive and so what they decided to forego this station and straighten out the alignment so it's a faster service, it's a shorter tunnel alignment serving the Capitol Hill district, but then connecting 
all the inner neighborhoods to that regional system with their first hill streetcar, as it was uh, called. So instead of $450 million, this was a two and a half mile line serving those inner uh, city neighborhoods for, uh, that we designed and built for $133 million. 10 stations, about a half mile uh, spacing of the stations. So connecting Union Station in the, in the south and, the, and then uh, the Capitol Hill Station in the north. Um, it can also provide uh, that commuter rail, as I mentioned, uh, more of a regional service. This is how um, Charlotte is, is expanding their streetcar lines, uh, providing that more ser uh, commuter service or regional service. Uh, Kansas City as well has more of a downtown starter service that's designed as a circulator service, but now they are planning extensions that will be more of that line hall or regional service. It can also be a supplemental service. Um, in, uh, in, in the work that we're doing in Minneapolis, they have a couple major arterials with, with bus rapid transit um, service being planned, but with the stop spacing that is appropriate for a bus ramp rapid transit project, you have uh, very large gaps in your, in your stops. And so that streetcar service that we are planning will provide that infill uh, more local connections for that service. So it's kind of counterintuitive that the bus is the more regional and that, that streetcar provides that more local service. But it's, you know, part of it too is about ride quality and, and a, a bus rapid transit service. If you have longer stop spacing, it makes, makes buses a, a much more uh, uh, compelling um, service, especially with ride quality. And then that rail uh, that rail option with a, with a streetcar or, or a light rail, um, there, there really is a, a response to ridership based on that ride quality that a, that a rail-based um, fixed guideway will, will provide. So and then the Portland streetcar and many other systems, Tucson, um, have been designed as those neighborhood local circulators. So connecting downtown neighborhoods, it promotes that uh, park, one, uh, park once philosophy, so people drive into the city from, from the suburbs or whatever, and they park, and then they use the, the streetcar to get around. You know, the ridership on the Portland streetcar system actually peaks uh, around midday, right around the lunchtime hours when people um, choose not to get in their cars, they choose to take the, the streetcar. Um, you know, but it also, a big benefit, as I mentioned, is development and there really is a response to that fixed guideway investment that uh, um, developers like to see because it provides that service for people to come to their developments or for those that live in their in the housing in, in a de certain development uh, because that fixed investment they know is not going away whereas a, a bus line can be rerouted and, and, and is less certain. So the Portland streetcar system, um, it was kind of a, a supplement to a more regional master plan, uh, which was called the 2040 plan, and that identified um, major centers, uh, regional centers and, and town centers connected by high capacity transit. Um, and so those, those centers are in the, the peach circles, as you see here. Um, but then, and so they had the, the initiative to uh, or, or the objective was to how are they going to manage population growth over the next 40 years, and 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 then each part of the region had their specific goals to um, absorb a certain percentage of that um, uh, that population growth, and the city of Portland was allocated, um, I think it was maybe 30,000 residents, and 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 city of Portland. You know, said, "Well, no, we're we're going to do more than that. We're going to do over 100,000 residents." And from that became, uh, they then went into another planning effort, uh, the Portland Concept Plan, that identified where there was new high density development potential. And that, so this is just a schematic. Downtown Portland's in the middle, but on the north end was known as the Hoyt Street Yards. And when I moved to Portland in 1992, this was just a railroad yard with a big roundhouse and, and, uh, and the 99-year lease with the railroad was, was coming up and the city was uh, you know, asked that the, the railroad vacate and then they wanted to uh, turn this into development. And likewise, in the south end with the south waterfront, this was historically a shipbuilding 
uh, industry and it was uh, more or less defunct and, and brownfields and so there was a concentrated effort towards uh, focused development and then creating that connection with what became the first phase of the Portland streetcar. So the Portland streetcar opened in 2001. Uh, it was two and a half miles, so it went to the Northwest District, which is at the top of your screen on the left, which was at the time the highest density neighborhood in Oregon, down to PSU, which is just on that north end of the, the um, orange section on the bottom. And then after that project, there was subsequent uh, smaller extensions that brought it all the way down to, to the south waterfront at the bottom of the screen. But the, um, the streetcar system overall was, was designed and built for $54 million, that was 2001. Um, and was largely paid for by local sources. So a big component was, was a tax that the property owners um, put upon themselves because they saw the benefit and the return in the, in the value of their properties and, and the economic development potential. But then also a tax increment uh, financing uh, mechanism that they, they, they issued bonds that were backed by that increment in the value that the tax receipts from the value of that land as the value increased over the years. And so that paid back the bonds. They also dedicated part on street parking revenues along the alignment. And so it was a it was really a cobbled together uh, financing plan. Even the federal money was really just a um, a, a trade with the, the local transit agency, TriMet, because they had to buy buses if if there was no streetcar, they would have had to provide a new bus line. And so those, those buses that would have served that bus line were then um, um, dedicated towards, towards this project. So this is a rendering of, of the Hoyt Street Yards. This is now on the north end of downtown looking towards the south. Downtown is in the bottom and south waterfront is, is way at the top of the screen right in the middle there. But the, the Hoy Street Yards were traversed by the, you see the roadway viaduct going all over the, uh, the railroad lines and you see the roundhouse there in the lower middle. And so the other initiative outside of the streetcar project was take down that viaduct and, and make it a, a surface street. And, and then we built the, we literally built the, the streetcar on bare ground through this district and waited for the development and the roadways and sidewalks to come in uh, afterwards as those properties developed. And so this is a, a similar um, perspective of Google Earth today, and you can see the, the, the density that has been achieved. You can also see at the top of the screen the, the taller towers near the river, that is the south waterfront. So there's been quite a response from the development community. It is, it is a bit of a perfect storm uh, with the, the Portland's uh, success story. The dotted line uh, in the bottom here goes across that river, and I'll, I'll touch on that. That's how the system has expanded as well. So we, we have now, um, we are now operating two lines. So the, again, the, on the left side is the, is the first streetcar line and the subsequent extensions down to South Waterfront. But then also we extended across the river uh, which is now a, a loop service. It goes, uh, essentially one line goes clockwise around the city and the other goes uh, <coughs> counterclock counter across the city. We had to cross a historic bridge on the north end to get over the Willamette River. And then uh, part of a partnering agent with the transit agency, they had a, a bigger regional light rail system uh, where they built a new crossing over the Willamette River and, the street, and we designed the streetcars to, to interline with the light rail. So this was a $150 million project. It was three and a half uh, miles long, and it did rely on a, a $75 million grant from, from FTA. But again, there was a large uh, contribution from the property owning, owners along the alignment, as well as t uh, parking revenues and, and also the tax increment uh, uh, financing model. So, um, this, the, basically, the response from the development community has been um, a perfect storm. It, it's been quite, quite a, an achievement. Um, over $5 billion, it's probably closer to $6 billion now in, in economic development along the lines. Uh, 17,000 new housing units in downtown along the alignment. 
and ridership uh, for the system is is um, some of the better better than some of the the light rail lines that are being served as well. So over f uh, 15,000 riders per day, um, and again th that ridership happens uh, pretty much all day long with the the peaks um, right during mid time or mid midday. Um, and you know, looking at some of the the calculations, uh, there there's um, uh, there was a, a study done about the 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 trip not traveled is uh, I think that was uh, I think it was referred to as but it was really you know how many automobile trips did we uh, eliminate from the system by uh, having people rely on on more transit and walking and, and developing uh, and intensifying the development in downtown and and the the estimates in in 2013 uh, were 70 million. Uh, a reduction in 70 million vehicle miles uh, per per year. The operating funds for the two lines is on the order of 12 million dollars per year. This is paid for in part by TriMet uh, with that um, kind of in replacement of that bus service that they would have to provide parking and as well as the local improvement districts districts uh, uh, paid for by the the property owners that are within uh, two block. Um, uh, radius of, of the alignment. But one of the seekers to success is with any project, you know, you, you have a budget and you really need to, you know, hone in and, and focus on keeping the costs uh, low and efficient. Um, you know, there, there's been a, I was part of a study with a, the, it's the Streetcar Coalition, um, which is a national organization of, of communities that, that have um, built streetcar systems. And, and really, there is a variety of the project costs all over, um, all over the map. Um, but they really depends on uh, whether or not you have to federalize a project or not. I highly recommend, if you can, to, to keep the projects uh, locally funded if you have the means. Um, keeping a, keeping a, a tight schedule so you avoid escalation costs. It's really important to have a, a project uh, sponsor. It, there is a difference if it's a transit agency and versus the city some, in some respects. Um, and that's just how you might want to partner with your uh, you know your utility agencies and and uh, traffic departments and and and, and whatnot. Um, uh, regional cost of, uh, index, of course, and and then you know each project is unique depending on on where you you know what kind of utilities are in the ground and and what kind of a service you want to provide. As I mentioned before, so the transit priority systems, uh, you know can help the service uh, run faster if that's desired. And, and, and of course, there's always unique um, uh, project-specific elements that have to be resolved. But it's really, you know, trying to keep it simple. It's easier said than done. Uh, we try to just retrofit those tracks into the, the street or the build in, built environment by just cutting a, a slot in the roadway and, and trying to, uh, you know, just feather the roadway crown to, to match the tracks. The photo on the bottom is in Detroit, the Campus Marches, um, you know, public square that was brand new. So they were very sensitive about um, tearing up the public square that they had just built about five years ago. Um, and so you can see how it was almost a surgical placement of those tracks. Um, we also just analyze every element. You know, what is, you know, what's truly necessary? You want tracks, you want vehicles, and you want stations and, and, and power. Um, but you know how you modify traffic signals and you, uh, whether or not you relocate utilities um, is is um, somewhat uh, ancillary and and can be uh, negotiated. You want to you want to make sure you're partnering with, every, with everyone and make sure their needs are met. But um, you know there's ways to go about these projects to keep costs down. And then you know configuration management too. So if there's if there are betterments or you know a new water line that wants to be replaced because you're expecting a, a new major development, um, you know those things are are managed and and uh, accounted for um, in separately if if you can help it. And there's many innovations that have been um, in play over the last uh, 12, 15 years, um, in, including um, you know transit signal priorities, how to to make the streetcars go faster, if that's you, 
what you want, with some with GPS systems that, that communicate with the traffic signals in order to progress the, the trains efficiently. And then, uh, as Adam mentioned, you know, this, is, this is his vehicle here in Dallas. Uh, wireless technology, you still need wires overhead to power uh, energy storage system, you know, essentially lithium batteries. Uh, but it's a way to um, address low clearances if your streetcar has to go under a bridge or if there's environmentally or historic sensitive uh, view sheds, uh, such as the case in Dallas here that it was a historic bridge that we needed to get across over the Trinity River and, uh, and so they didn't want to put you know, poles on, on a historic bridge that would have ruined the character of the bridge. And I was, uh, I was the design engineer for Oklahoma City and just recently we and we're about a month, month and a half away from opening that system. And about a year ago, the mayor asked us, because um, he's on the uh, Autonomous Vehicle Task Force for U USDOT, he asked us to do a study on, on what it would take to actually uh, create an autonomous operation for the streetcar, and, uh, which might sound scary with a, um, with, a, with a train without a driver, but you know, out of that study, um, you know, my take on it first is like autonomous vehicles are coming anyway, so why not start with one direction or one dimension at a time and worry about you know what's in front of you? But but also you know maybe you wouldn't get rid of that driver. Maybe they become a conductor, and instead of being closed in a cab, they are now in the cabin. You know interfacing with customers, making them feel more comfortable with uh, using transit because it's always kind of an unknown. You know, how do we pay for tickets? You know, where do I go? How do I get back? And uh, also provide that sense of security too. So it was a really exciting study and I've, you know, I've been really fortunate in my career to be involved in all these projects and been part of the innovations a lot along the way. And, uh, you know, I think that is the end of my, uh, my, my presentation other than, um, you know, again, if you were to move forward, you know, it's important to understand your purpose and need and, and to identify a champion, um, you know, whether it's your economic development department or, um, or your mayor or all of our board Erie. Um, and so uh, we, with that, you know, I, I look forward to answering any, any questions. So thank you. And we're just after 2 o'clock here. I hope people can hang in here just a little bit more. Um, if we've got time, I can go quickly through a presentation on ideas specifically for Erie. And then we can open it up to questions. Does that sound good? We're OK? OK. So. I'm going to cut out a lot of the fluff in my presentation here. Um, some pictures of uh, how Erie once was and, and the streetcars that shaped downtown Erie and uh, how we can support that existing land use and bring new com you know, compatible land uses with an investment in something like streetcar technology. Um, so I've got some slides on how others, you know, picked services, but, you know, Mark really covered a lot of that. Um, but, you know, the goals in a study like this could be to, you know, something basic like strengthen the linkage between central area, you know, central area activity areas, you know, down to the bayfront. Um, and, and also goals like focusing investment that is happening in the region, development that's happening in the region, focus it into the core as much as you can. There's lots of land, there's lots of utilities, take advantage of them. Um, quick example here, uh, you know, a, a study uh, in Minneapolis on, on a transit corridor, and they, they looked at different transportation modes and um, ended up deciding to focus in on the core of the system, and they picked a streetcar as their, their preferred technology. Um, and uh, in this case, they were using the same lanes as cars and trucks. Um, uh, they wanted very recognizable vehicles. They wanted, you know, fewer stops, all-day service. Um, and, you know, why is it that they selected streetcar technology? Well, 
maybe one of the driving factors is the economic development potential. Um, and again, Mark covered some of this. Um, you know, um, they found it, uh, there's a study by the uh, Twin Cities Metropolitan Council that found that um, in, in a Seattle case, within three blocks of streetcar, um, the property in, increased, you know, 123% compared to, you know, this is Seattle. <laughs> Seattle's doing well overall, but around the streetcar is really where the concentration, concentrated development took place. Mark talked about Portland. Here are images of that south waterfront area before and after. And um, wherever these projects are happening, we're seeing a lot of return on the investment in the urban development. And that's larger cities, you know, like Dallas, and more modestly sized cities like Little Rock, you know, Arkansas, Lowell, Massachusetts, uh, cities that are more comparable in size to Erie. Um, there's some promotional stuff about AECOM here. Yes, we do a lot of streetcar projects. Um, so you can enjoy the nice glossy pictures. So Erie, um, you know, one of the previous slides, I'll just look at it for a moment. Um, you know, average length for what could be some comparable corridors is, you know, a little more than two miles, two and a half miles. So if you're looking in Erie, where might that two plus mile corridor be? Well, it sounds like the Urban Land Institute came to a similar conclusion. Um, State Street is where the core of the system used to be, right? We've got our, we've got our streetcar expert down here. State was the core. Sure, and you can see that from the land use, right? <clears throat> okay, so here's downtown. Um, so we've, we've got the core of the downtown here. We've got the, the bayfront. And then what do you call the neighborhood just across the tracks up towards St. Vincent Hospital? Federal Hill. Federal Hill, does that sound good? Shall we call it that? And then, of course, there are great destinations beyond that. I know about the zoo, um, uh, Mercyhurst University, there's the VA Medical Center, and some other you know, great neighborhoods in between, just beyond that two-mile circle. And, and you want to connect those in whatever way you can. There's the bus network now, and maybe you know, future extension of, of the downtown improvement system. OK. So let's focus right in on this two-mile core. And the other thing I wanted to mention is uh, I understand that there is a water transit connection, a, like a water taxi that in the summertime takes you from the, the bayfront over to Presque Isle, correct? Uh, I'm a Seattle native myself. and. Um, in, when I was doing planning in Seattle in the 90s, um, I was very interested in how to get from downtown over to an urban neighborhood, West Seattle, across Elliott Bay. And I was somebody who was kind of pushing the idea of, let's look at some kind of a water transit connection, you know, to make that connection. And so they started one. Uh, it was a very modest sized boat to start out with, not a lot of service. But it became hugely popular uh, as, as downtown continued to grow, as the multimodal system kept developing downtown. And now look at the size of the boat. I think you can carry about 400 people on that boat. And it runs at least every half hour, and maybe more frequently. And when you get over to the West Seattle side, there's a shuttle you know, that meets you there to take you to urban neighborhoods. Uh, but they're like, there's this great beach area, kind of like Presque Isle. And so you can rent a bike. You can rent a kayak to paddle around out there. There's a nice restaurant that you can hang out at. Um, so, you know, multimodal stuff emerging around the, uh, the water connection. And we can have the same sort of thing here in Erie, I think. Okay, and in the core of this, we've got Union Station. We talked before about intercity connections, and you definitely want that intercity, you know, portal 
to be connected into whatever the core of your transit system is. And St. Vincent Hospital, up at the uh, upper end of the Hill neighborhood? Federal Hill. And then when we get down to the Bayfront, you know, a few different options maybe to look at. One that we gave some thought to, you know, we, we know that the Erie uh, Intermodal Transportation Center for uh, EMTA and intercity buses is right next door to us here by the library. So that would be a key place to connect to, of course, right? So maybe you've got a line that just goes straight there. Maybe you extend from that. Um, are the tracks still? Well, it connects right over to the, the hotel and convention center too. And I know that there's been some new development around the convention center as in parking structure. Well, there are other potential uses for that land also and, and bring something like this in and instead of thinking of three stories of parking, you could be thinking of 20 stories of residential or hotel or office. Okay. Well, you all as locals know this stuff better than I do. I, I would love to, you know, discuss options with anybody, um, and I can bring, you know, my perspective and, and from, you know, other experts that I work with, but you're the ones who know your city. So, you know, there's another option too, which would be to just kind of head straight on down towards the bayfront. And, and you would want to have a study where you look at these alternatives and the pluses and you know, the pros and cons of, of all of them, costs and, and benefits. Um, so if you were to go straight on down, um, there are lots of options for connecting that water tr taxi type you know, service. Um, this would have a little bit of a, a walk to get you over to the bus, you know, hub. And, you know, maybe your water taxi comes in, something like that. But there are lots of options to explore. But in the end, State Street is really the core of the system. And the goal here isn't just to have transit on, on State Street. It's to have a great place, you know, up and down State Street. And as you design the transportation system, you design it for all kinds of users who are going to want to be down there. The bicyclists, they're going to keep wanting to come. You want as many people walking as possible. And, uh, you know, where you're thinking about streetcar, you could think like San Francisco here. Um, behind the, uh, the, the vintage streetcar you see in the, in the front there is uh, an electric trolley bus that's sharing the lane, sharing stops. And you could do the same with the local bus system here and provide benefit to the local bus system as you're creating a, you know, priority transit environment. And just a quick note about that. This isn't a perfect example for, for State Street, but uh, the images up above are the transit tunnel in Seattle. And that is a shared environment between buses and light rail vehicles. And at one moment, you'll look down, and you'll see these high capacity light rail vehicles. And a few moments later, the trains pass through, and, and there are the buses in the same lanes. And so, you know, could have the same kind of principle on, on uh, State Street. OK, that is it for presentation. Uh, maybe we want to bring up house lights a little bit and uh, switch over to uh, Question and answer. Discussion, not just question and answer. Let's thank our presenters for their time and effort today. Uh, just, be, just before we uh, introduce Joel Natale, who's going to run our Q&A for us, I'd like to recognize some people in the audience. Um, John Bookna from the Downtown Area Partnership is, was here. And John, thank you for coming. 
Uh, Kathy Rosdick from Erie City Planning is, is with us, uh, one of the key people uh, that I'm glad is here to see this. Uh, John Persinger from the Erie Downtown Development Corporation is with us, John. And um, who's this other guy? Shember, is that how you pronounce that? Joe? Oh, the mayor of Erie, Joe Shember, is with us. Joe, thank you very, very much. Um, the, ironically, the last time uh, I was in a meeting with both of those was a um, a campaign meeting, uh, it was our event, uh, we had a discussion uh, about these same kind of issues and both John and, and Joe were there and here they are again. So thank you very, very much. So Joel, if you'd like to uh, begin our Q&A and I think I know who our first questionnaire is going to be. Yes, Mr. Springer. Thanks. Thank you for a very excellent presentation. And I want to give special thanks to Brookville Equipment Corporation. I came out of Philadelphia, and in, uh, on, in September 5th of 2005, Brookville Equipment Corporation had completed and placed in service 18 new president, rebuilt President Conference Committee streetcars. An impossible job done by some tremendous people that Andy works with. The bottom line is they took a line, Southeastern Pennsylvania Transportation Authority had abandoned a lot of lines, but there was some political pressure to put it back on Girard Avenue. And there was only one company that could really provide the restoration, uh, restoration that was needed for those streetcars, Brookville Equipment Corporation, so thank you so much for doing that. Over the years, Brookville has done some amazing jobs. And when you think about Erie's history, 129 years ago, a very important event occurred. We went from five mile an hour horse car operation to 10 mile an hour electric streetcar operation on June 29th, 1889. That was a dramatic event, and it had tremendous uh, repercussions from the standpoint that overnight, streetcars expanded everywhere. You could go from Erie to Cleveland by trolley, Erie to Buffalo by trolley. Between 1906 and 1922, you could go from Oneonta, that's a city in eastern New York, through Buffalo, Erie, Cleveland, Chicago, all the way up to Milwaukee, Wisconsin, a distance of over a thousand miles. It would have taken you four days. You'd have 20 different connections to make. But the bottom line is the streetcar really was, really was king at that time. Of course, the automobile came along, the depression came along. By 1970, there were only seven streetcar systems left. But our experts in the government sent experts over to Western Europe, and guess what? Remember, we rebuilt Western Europe after World War II, and they found these new, actually, they found what they call tram cars over there. They came back all excited. What were we gonna call this? Because the streetcar had a rather old-fashioned reputation. They came up with the expression, light rail transit. Now, none of us can pick up these vehicles, they're heavy. But that was a complete transformation. If the streetcar had been invented in 2018, it would have been declared the outstanding achievement of the century. It is the only transit vehicle that you can put not only on a city street, you can put it in a subway, on a private right of way, or also on an elevated structure. No other vehicle can you do that with. It's phenomenal. It has a lot of versatility. And over the years, the experts have found that you know, the streetcar wasn't so bad after all. And if you go into Toronto, Toronto has North America's largest streetcar system. Its busiest line is King Street. On every workday, 65,000 people are riding that King Street streetcar line. Toronto and the province of Ontario have made a commitment to upgrade the service. And it's not just in Toronto. You go into the cities of Kitchener and Waterloo. Uh, Kitchener and Waterloo, each one of them are about the size of Erie. They are gonna be opening up a brand new, they call it light rail, but that's just a modern term for a streetcar. That's gonna come within the next few months. So the bottom line is Erie has a tremendous opportunity. So what, what would it take to make this work? The first thing is the system has to be designed to generate 
widespread, widespread local support. It's not going to work if you have significant segments of the population who are in opposition to this. Everybody has to be on board and everybody should gain something out of it. It's, it shouldn't be a win-lose situation. For the streetcar system to work successfully in Erie, it has to be a win-win for everybody. That's the first thing. So it's going to take a lot, of, a lot of care on that. The second thing in designing the route, the route has to serve a real transportation function. And the most successful systems are those systems that have the streetcar line on a dedicated portion of the street. If you intermingle regular traffic on a streetcar line, it's, it's a recipe for problems. You have to have a dedicated right of way. And the third thing is you have to keep it simple. The Detroit system opened up uh, in 2017. It's a beautiful system. And once again, Brookville Equipment Corporation supplied the six streetcars for that system. Detroit had talked about having a rapid transit system since the 1920s, but it never got built. But it took private enterprise. Companies like Quicken Loans bought the naming rights. General Motors, Penske Tire and Trucking Company, they all got together because Detroit needed attention, needed attention quick. So while the city fathers were having some difficulties, corporate America decided we're gonna save Detroit and it's working. My wife and I, we walked that line, it's 3.3 miles long and you can see economic development with a capital A. I mean, it's in that corridor, that central corridor served by that light, by that streetcar line, that is really turning around very nicely. And I've got that documented in the first book that has been written that includes not only the history of Detroit streetcars, but the new Q line, the line on Woodward Avenue. That's in my brand new book, which just came out Monday. The bottom line is, I think the streetcar idea is, is fabulous. And I wanna thank Brian Pitzner for all the work he and his people in all of Ward Erie have done. The fourth thing is you need to have an operating plan to take care of the expenses in the future. The fifth thing is the plan should include volunteers. This is a tremendous way to get senior citizens and, and other people involved. You can have a lot of people as volunteers to cut down on the costs and there's nothing like an energetic volunteer to really enhance the operation. I think that could be a tremendous boost. Erie can be not only a, a demonstration city for the, for the size of it, but if you can get a key group of volunteers involved with it, that could be a really major plus. And the sixth thing, talk with other systems. Find out what's working. And look at the trolley museums that are available in the United States for a lot of expertise. Museums like the Pennsylvania Trolley Museum in Washington, Pennsylvania, it's about 150 miles away. They do restoration work every day. They do all kinds of impossible things every day. There is a lot of free advice out there. The bottom line, keep it simple. This is a plus. This can happen. It's going to take everybody to get on board. There's nothing like the clickety-clack of a streetcar on the track. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Springer. So we're open for questions for our panel. Would you raise your hand? <laughs> he, had, he got to do a special statement. We'll talk, come over to court here. Could you just introduce yourself to? Yeah, hi, I'm Court. In Pittsburgh, the contemporary transit line of choice between the first and third largest economic centers in Pittsburgh, between Pittsburgh and Oakland, are to emulate the health line in Cleveland with bus rapid transit. And I believe the Urban Land Institute recommended a rubber tired trolley on this route. This conversation's been pretty exclusive to the expensive uh, uh, trolley railed approach, which I think in Pittsburgh they estimated to cost 10 times more. Uh, what's the thought on uh, rubber tired versus lane track? Is 
that working? There we go. Yeah, so the, uh, you know, there is a major expense if you were to dedicate, uh, create a, a dedicated right of way like the P Pittsburgh system and, uh, you know, with their system of uh, on ramps and, and the, the dedicated BRT uh, corridor or right of way. Uh, there, you know, really it's that choice that you would go, you would make as a community uh, when you went through a, a planning process to decide on what your mode of choice would be. But really there, there is um, the document, as I mentioned, um, of why streetcar is, you know, it's really driven by um, the economic development. There really is a, a truly a response. Uh, a more positive response uh, with that fixed infrastructure that's in the ground that, that a developer knows is not uh, going to move like a bus service um, could. Um, and, you know, it, ride quality is another issue. You know, uh, um, you know, some BRT systems are just kind of branded bus lines too. So, um, but, you know, it comes back to what you as a community would want to choose as well. But th those are some of the advantages that others have based their decision upon. So, Just quick follow up on that. So the company that we work for has had involvement with the health line in, in Cleveland and, and design involvement with the, uh, the bus rapid transit or BRT system in Pittsburgh. And, and it's really you know, about the market that you're trying to, to share and how long it takes to get from one point to the other. And, um, you know, there was a lot of investment that went into that wonderful health line in Cleveland a, as a model. And a, a lot of that investment was in how to make the street really work for moving a lot of transit customers, and that, that was the priority. If that's the priority here, you can have that kind of a, a system. If the priority is more for local circulation, and, and to uh, you know, foster as much development as possible, maybe the system looks a little different than that. Questions? Um, I um, was writing back and forth with uh, the people that were working on Elon Musk's uh, tube, and I was, um, I was thinking that they were thinking of going underground, especially with um, goods. And I wrote back to them, oh, okay, oh, that sounds good because you wouldn't be taking up any green space or anything. And uh, you could go anywhere under anything to get from one point to another, even across the country sometime. The only thing I thought of is I wouldn't want to be in that as a person. <laughs> and also, well, you had um, a picture on, on the screen there, and it looked like you were still in a tube. Um, I just don't think that's right for people. It's too claustrophobic. Well, it but, is. It's... But with the goods, I mean, yeah. uh, that's such a, a good idea. I think that's what they were writing about on his site. Mm -hmm. So for, um, I'm sorry, hang on, I'm gonna, wow, okay. Uh, no, it, you know, like I mentioned during my presentation, that, you know, this, this technology uh, is subject uh, to opinion and a lot of, you know, like there's a lot of speculation, a lot of uh, debate on, you know, do I don't want to get in a tube or I don't want to, you know, and, and I get it. Uh, but, you know, similar to every other mode, like from the train to the airplanes uh, to trucks, we started all of that with freight, moving mail, moving goods, you know, before we put people in it and moved, you know, mass amounts of people on it. So we will start off with freight. In terms of the going underground, it, it again comes down to expense. The moment you go way up, or go underground, it like just exponentially increases the cost of construction to do something like that. So basically, that will be determined um, on the corridor. Like, what what is the best thing for that individual particular corridor? So, uh, like I, Elon Musk has a boring. This is called the Boring Company, which is another tunneling company that is working on this technology as well. And they're looking currently at a tunnel between Baltimore and Washington D.C. And they're trying to facilitate all the approvals to get something like that started. And that will be going underground. 
ground and it will be you know doing some you know interesting things but that all of those discussions those are the things that we're at the table now figuring out uh, and like with every other technology, you know, uh, President Van Buren back in the 18, late 1800s was notorious for being anti-rail. Like he believed that they were the machines of the devil because they polluted and made noise and, and, he, and he made it to president. <laughs> so, you know, so there is always gonna be like, an, 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 you know, justifiably so, um, hesitant, skepticism is our nature to be hesitant and skeptical about new technology. Um, There'll be a trial and error, but those are all the things that, that we're working through as we go through feasibility studies and we discuss it with people in Washington, uh, transportation experts, we, we talk to the technologists, you know, that those are all the, the big questions that we're dealing with right now. Do you have a cost differential of what per mile the Hyperloop would cost vis-a-vis -vis the boring company? So that would be more of a range. Once again, it would depend on what the corridor finds is the most uh, viable. Uh, you know, like, will it go underground? Will it go over? You know, like, will, will it be an elevated structure in certain segments? So it, it would depend. Uh, we are still working on the, on the cost. What we do know is that it doesn't take as much um, like when you think about road construction, because at first when we were looking at this, uh, you know, at this project, and we were trying to get an idea of how much would it cost to actually make it happen, um, I was on a trip to New Orleans on holiday, and uh, you know, I was traveling on the I-10, which is an elevated highway all through the bayou, all through the swamp, and it struck me, and I'm like, wait a minute, this is th this is kind of like what we're trying to do. So I got in touch with the Louisiana D Department of Transportation. Uh, finally got a hold of engineering t an engineering team that gave me a cost estimate, the ones that they used to quantify how much it costs to build that type of structure. Uh, all that worked only to find out later that Hyperloop is not going to need the type of uh, structures that a highway or a road does. It's gonna be a lot less than that. We don't know exactly how much yet. We just have parameters right now. But uh, I can say that it's, gonna, it's not going to be as expensive as a, as a highway construction project per mile. Uh, but it's also not going to be um, perhaps as inexpensive as starting a passenger rail, rail corridor uh, or service on an existing you know, rail line. Great. More questions, please. Just wondering, in trying to sell. And we've got hot audio here. Can we turn that down just a little bit? If you're, if you're trying to sell this to uh, the whole idea, the whole concept of having something like this, to get the money to do this, and you're talking about transportation centers, would you not include, say, the Erie Airport with that? The, I mean, as being another destination where, where people are flying in and wanting to get downtown to these other places, if you're going to do the whole package, would that, would that not be a better selling point than just up and down State Street? I would say that, of course, you would like to incorporate in, you know, an airport and a major transportation center. My experience with light rail projects and, and regional transit, bus rapid transit, is where it's a wonderful thing to tie in to the airport. Um, there's often more ridership from the people who work at the airport than people who are coming and going by the planes. And, and it's in the downtown, it's in the core, and the inner neighborhoods where you really get the core of your ridership. I, maybe that's a way to think of it. That's where you're going to get the core of your ridership. But of course, you know, it's going to be in your goals to connect, you know, those multimodal hubs as best you can. I actually have something to add to that. Yeah. Uh, uh, back in 2015, I led a, a, a task force for Mayor uh, for the Mayor Coleman in Columbus that dealt with connecting the airport better to downtown. 
Uh, this was at a time when Columbus, Ohio was bidding really hard for either the Republican National Convention or the Democratic National Convention. So they wanted to show that we had a good link between the airport and the downtown convention spaces. And in preparation for that, you know, we, you know, we did this task force to, to study it. How can we better connect uh, our airport by, by transit to the downtown? And we did a whole bunch of best practices. Uh, we looked at different communities in the US, some in Canada. What we found was that a, a, a link between the business core and the airport uh, is a definitely good idea because the whole premise is once again like being able to move across modes as a passenger, right, from air to wherever you're going. But what we found was that that because the ridership wasn't as robust as you, what, what you would want um, in other areas, that was a leg or a segment with, within a, a, a light rail system that should come maybe like the second or the third line and have the higher frequency, higher ridership lines happen first that could fund or pave the way for that airport connection. If you're interested to see uh, you know, some interesting uh, spins on, on connecting airports, check out Miami. Miami, Florida has a, a, a a passenger transit hub uh, close to their airport that is like really, really, really impressive. Uh, there's another one in Memphis that didn't turn out so well. So if you want to see some, ooh, we didn't do as well as we wanted to do, Memphis has one as well, the, a, a, a transit hub. Uh, so who else? Portland, of course, connects their airport. Uh, Seattle and Chicago. And the, the first actual mass transit extension to an airport was Cleveland. And, and that goes right into the terminal. And I happen to live on a neighborhood where I can transfer once and, and walk from my home to get right into the airport terminal, and I'm very grateful for that. Maybe one or two more. Any other questions? Thank you. Well, thank you, everybody. And let's have a round of applause for our, our presenters once again for taking the time and effort to, to come to Erie and, and share their expertise with us. We really very much appreciate it. So this is the end of this part of the meeting. All aboard Erie is going to have a, a business meeting uh, following, though you may want to stay for that. Uh, but uh, again, thank you very much for being a part of this very special presentation.